Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Michelle White, Senior Curator at the Manil. We're thrilled to have Hilton Owls here tonight to deliver the first of a two-part lecture series. Part two will be this Thursday at 6 p.m., same place, and we hope you can join us. This lecture is a part of the museum's annual Marion Barthelme Lecture Series. It's presented in honor of the late Manil trustee, Marion Barthelme Fort. Each year, a distinguished speaker is invited to explore works here in the collection, key artists, or aspects of the museum's collection. Marion Barthelme Fort was an active member of Houston's artistic and literary communities. She was also a distinguished writer. She was correspondent for Time Magazine. She wrote Women in the Texas Populist Movement, Letters to the Southern Mercury, and was a contributor to the New Yorker's Talk of the Town. She was also president of Imprint and Gulf Coast and served on the boards of the Chinati Foundation and the Alley Theater. We would like to thank Marion's family who's here with us tonight. Thank you to Jeff Fort, Christina Van Dyke Fort, and Catherine Barthelme for being here tonight and making this possible. As with all of the Manil programs, the Marion Barthelme Lecture is free and open to the public. So a few housekeeping notes, if you could please leave your face masks on for tonight. And if you haven't silenced your cell phone, please do so now. Uh, Hilton will be taking your questions at the end of the talk, so just save your questions until then and raise your hands and Tony will come around with a microphone. Uh, we are recording uh, this lecture tonight. I'm also excited to let you know that both of Hilton's books, The Women and White Girls, are available at the bookstore with signed copies and the bookstore will be remaining open through the end of the lecture for another 30 minutes after we complete tonight. And I'd like to thank everyone that's streaming right now live and for our audience on the lawn. I'd now like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Hilton Owls. Hilton Owls began his career as a contributor to The New Yorker in 1989, writing pieces for Talk of the Town. He became a staff writer in 1994, theater critic in 2002, and lead theater critic in 2012. Before coming to The New Yorker, he was a staff writer for The Village Voice and an editor at large at Vibe. His reviews are provocative contributions to the discourses around theater, race, class, sexuality, and identity in American culture. His first book, The Women, was published in 1996, followed by White Girls, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in 2014, and winner of the 2014 Lambada Literary Award for Nonfiction. His most recent book, I Don't Remember, was published by Penguin in 2020. It's a book-length essay on his experiences in AIDS-era New York. Owls is also a distinguished curator, and if you've had the privilege of seeing any of his recent exhibitions, they include Alice Neal, Uptown, and God Made My Face, a collective portrait of James Baldwin, both at Zwerner Gallery. In 2017, Owls won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism and the Langston Hughes Medal in 2018. He is an associate professor of writing at Columbia University's School of the Arts and has taught at Yale University and Smith College. He lives in New York City. And I'll say, like, personally, Hilton, thank you. It has been an absolute privilege to get to know you and work with you over the last few years. Hilton has been researching in our collections, and we're so grateful for your sustained engagement and curiosity in our archives and in our works of art, and it's certainly ignited for all of us new, we, new ways of seeing our collection. And we could not be more grateful for your voice now as we also reflect on the last 50 years of our institution's history. And also as we can conclude a year of looking back at 1971, that includes our exhibition of Virginia Jaramillo's work, an artist in the deluxe show, and also the foyer here tonight, which we've installed in 
in acknowledgement of 1971 with artists that were a part of the exhibitions Hilton will be speaking about tonight, William T. Williams, Frank Bowling, and Peter Bradley. Hilton, we hope this is not the end of you and that we can continue our conversations and your Manil scholarship. I think we're, we're just beginning. So thank you so much and please help me welcome Hilton Alce. Thank you very much. Um, it is indeed a, a very great honor for me to be here tonight. Um, as you'll hear in the talk, I've been coming down since 2016, and um, I don't know if there are any publishers in the building tonight, but um, there are some pretty steamy books down there in the archives. Um, <laughs> one of the great things about <clears throat> falling in love with Dominique <clears throat> in particular is that she really didn't have any thing to hide. And if you go through the, her letters um, and, and archives, and even being annoyed with John sometimes, um, she really sort of put it out there and she wanted you to, she wanted to, know, she wanted to know who you were and she wanted you to know who she was. So it's all there. Um, the archivists downstairs are so incredible. They all have a great sense of humor. Um, it was always a pleasure to come here and laugh and look at footage and think about these really extraordinary people who did something um, very few people do. So um, this, this, these talks are called What, what Would Dominique Do and Did? Um, she was, uh, um, well, I'll, I'll just describe her in the, in the talk. And... Um, of the two people uh, involved in this extraordinary marriage and collaboration, she was for sure the, the less romantic of the two. <clears throat> Oops. Nope. Nothing. It should be that one. Ah, to the side, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Michelle. This is a story about love. It is also about history and the ways in which history gets jettisoned or buried, especially by those who believe all stories are their story or reflective of the stories they need to tell, want to tell, if only to stand in reflected glory. And like any modern day fairy tale or fable, Let's just call it that. This story has landscapes and villains, dreams and dashed hopes, ignorance and valor, and at its heart, an earnest heroine who, despite her fame and riches, taste and intelligence, remained essentially an innocent, if you define innocence, as I do, as a kind of blamelessness. That innocence, though, was not so much born out of ignorance as a kind of trusting pragmatism. And when certain of life's aspects showed itself for what it was, she had the language to identify it and the wherewithal to keep dreaming despite various treacherous landscapes and despite villainy, which is another aspect of love, intrepid faith in the thing you are doing and will be doing next despite the world and because of it. But as in any, any fairy tale or fable, which is to say any story with a moral filled with fantastic dreams and character flaws, innocence can often lead to unintentional moral blunders. And if the fairy tale has a Catholic strain, as this one does, the mistakes become, in the end, a chance for penance, enlightenment, and a greater understanding about how to love better and why. You know our heroine's name, Dominique de Menil, and something of her background and the history of the place you're sitting in this evening, but I think for the sake of conversation and thought, let's sketch some of it out anyway, because they are part of the character of our story. 
Born in Paris in 1908, Dominique Isaline Zella Henriette Clarisse Schlumberger was the middle daughter of three raised in that city's seventh arrondissement. A nice enough part of town, its hallmarks are the Eiffel Tower and the Champ de Mar. Eugene Ager's photographic descriptions of the neighborhood are remarkable in what they reveal, which is to say an unremarkable Paris hamlet dotted with little neighborhood shops, stayed, a sort of Parisian Park Avenue, empty of idiosyncrasy, safe, with its share of shops that the young Dominique haunted in search of bibelots, artifacts, cast off, that needed rescuing, collecting, to be thought about. <clears throat> Dominique's parents, Conrad and Louise Schlumberger, then um, were more interesting than their class dictated that they be. Protestant and intellectually curious, Claude worked as a physicist too during the years before World War I, invented and developed along with his brother Marcel, an ele electromagnetic sounding device that facilitated the discovery and charting of oil deposits in the earth. That device, which they leased to various companies, accounted for the family's wealth, which was not tremendous when Dominique was a girl. Back then, the family was haute bourgeois until fortune made them otherwise. That device is worth pausing over a moment. I'm from Brooklyn, where there is no earth or rich oil deposits, only subways. So Claude's invention that has no official name that I can find but I like looking at the drawings of it. And besides, it's a wonderful metaphor for what his daughter would make her life's work, which is to say, searching out and finding and bringing forth those minerals, which is to say, those artists and their production that she believed enriched the earth and thus the earth's possibilities. But we are getting ahead of our story. Like her father, Dominique had a great interest in physics and no great skill at small talk. There could be also a certain imperious way of dealing with people, but I think that's to be expected. We all know daughters who are beloved by their fathers tend to move more easily in the world because they not only have that rare experience, a good experience with the patriarchy, they are not uncomfortable with trying on, at least for a bit, the clothes that made the man, but cutting them to fit their own shape as they argue with the original shape. Again, like Claude, Dominique studied science. At the Sorbonne, she took advanced degrees in mathematics and physics, fields of study that, for the layman at least, is like speaking another language because it is another language, one that is grounded in the struggle to articulate how energy and force shift and change not only you, but consciousness and the world. Force is observable, of course, in our stars and the planets and closer to home, in how we reach, talk, and push one another away or pull one another close. And it's there in the artifacts we create to express the, the marriage of the imagination and energy and all those pictures and objects that have the ability to make us feel something profound, silent, and moved. In the end, Dominique, the future curator, didn't take an academic view of that force. And you can see it in the show she, she curated and the objects she collected and the stories she lived to tell. But towards the end, start of the American Depression at least, the images that captured her imagination moved. As we learn in William Middleton's essential biography, Double Vision, Dominique, after completing her first leg of education, there would be many, many more. She never stopped learning, left Paris, and went to Germany, where she worked as a production assistant on Joseph von Sternberg's The Blue Angel. It was tw 1929, and she was 21. Her family, being not adverse to the modern world, had a reasonable interest in cinema, too, but taking the job didn't have much to do with their interests, <clears throat> I don't think as it had a great deal to do with her friend, Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach. Indeed, it was Anne-Marie who introduced, who would introduce Dominique 
to German bohemianism in general and certain key figures, von Sternberg, Klaus and Erika Mann, Thomas Mann's gay children in particular. Anna Marie figures briefly in Middleton's book, of course, but I think she's writ larger in this story, certainly from my perspective, because to me she's a pivotal figure in the making of young Dominique and an early example for Dominique of love. So let's bring Anna Marie out from the margins and see her through Dominique's eyes. Born the daughter of a wealthy Swiss industrialist, Anna Marie's mother was a bisexual woman who was related to Bismarck. Theatrical and self-dramatizing, Frau Schwarzenbach preferred her daughter to dress like a boy. Dominique and Anne Marie met at Fetan, a Zurich-based boarding school for girls from prosperous families. At the school, Anne Marie became a confidant of Dominique's. From that early age, Anne Marie knew who she was. When she was 20, Anne Marie wrote to her friend, Pastor Ernst Mertz, I can tell you that there are only women whom I can love with real passion. Following her studies, Anne Marie worked as a travel writer and photographer, and one of the projects I'd love to see published is a collection of her work and the letters that act as a kind of self-portrait. Her photographs, documentarian in approach, are clear and factual. Her writing is more interesting, repertorial, but the world seen at a slant. Because despite her great beauty, fineness of mind, and low, distinctly quote-unquote male attitude, she drank to excess and eventually struggled with morphine addiction. Like many gay women of the time, she had no place and the world let her know it. Drugs softened the blows even as she struck them too. Anne-Marie was, by virtue of her mother's isolating ways, strangely unprepared for the world, or a world that Dominique had been socialized in as a heterosexual or presumably heterosexual girl of increasing wealth and thus social position. Much beloved by Carson McCullers and other artistic women in the 30s and 40s, Schwarzenbach remains one of my favorite powerful gay women who turn up again and again in histories of the times. She died in 1942 and who changed the times. McCullough's dedicated her second novel, 1941's Reflection in a Golden Eye, a great queer work about an army captain who can't cope with his homosexual desires, so becomes a sadist, and so on, to Anne Marie, despite the fact that Anne Marie's treatment of the writer was rough. Once, she kicked Carson out of bed because she was too flat-chested and told her to send the stripper and novelist Gypsy Rose Lee up instead. I told you that I knew a lot about Anne-Marie, who is my kind of guy, an androgynous bad boy that brings out the mother in me. But truth to tell, I was startled to find out that she figured in Dominique's story. I never knew much about the women she was close to from her own class. In the end, though, she only added to Dominique's aura, and I wonder if that's what Fariha, her daughter, felt when she heard from her mother once that if she had not married John, she would have ended up living with Anne-Marie. It's important to remember here that Dominique was born for all intents and purposes in the 19th century in a place where oppression and greed and torture and colonization happened somewhere else across the sea. Politics, unless it was something like French, the French penchant for anti-Semitism and the Dreyfus case, <clears throat> happened elsewhere, and that one way of love for women was to live in a kind of romance with other women that was primarily linguistic. All those letters, all those diary entries, and that physical intimacy, if it existed at all, was part of that language. There was no queer studies back then, per se, but there was queer studies in the letters women wrote and shared, particularly if they were from an educated class. So, no matter what Dominique did with her body or let Anne-Marie do with her body, the point is this relationship between a femme and a butch had an indelible effect on our heroine and that the experience not only opened Dominique up to difference, including her own, it italicized what she had learned at home, 
which is that male power was not unassailable and that women had power as well and that dressing it up in stereotypically fem female attire awaiting to be grand permission, granted permission to be free was a joke. The physics of desire was not gender specific. You can try to shut difference out, but it will always find you and out itself. Always be, never seem to be, Claude said to his bright daughter, and who was Dominique becoming once she returned to France after her time in Berlin? There was love and there was more learning, and each was embodied in Jean de Menil. Born in 1940, 1904, Jean, he would angl anglicize his name when he became a U.S. citizen in 1962, was 26 when they met, the Catholic son of a titled ex-army officer whose family was undone financially by the war. By the time he met Dominique at a party in 1930, Jean was helping support his family by working as a banker. At night, he took courses in political science, eventually earning degrees at the Science Po and a law degree from the University de Paris. Capitalism and concern, faith and practicality. Jean was not unlike the people who had captivated Dominique from childhood on, people who could dream, and whose very dreams were the solid groan beneath their feet, people who were not made unsteady by the act of becoming. Not long after they met and began courting, <coughs> and they were married in 1931, Dominique sent her intended an image that told him something about her past and her difference. In this photo, she's dressed as a boy mechanic. And in another picture that includes John, there's Dominique's great friend, Anne-Marie. She and Jean are wearing the same trench coats. They are a family. The picture is framed by laughter and Jean's acceptance of Dominique as she was, with her own spirit intact, the individual spirit being an act of divine creation, just as art was divine creation made manifest. Dominique was her own art, but she was not above the laws of her class and her gender. And we have all known and loved women like this, women who deviate from their presumed narrative to make their own stories. But despite these deviations, they adhere to what society has made of them, has made of so many women. Part of Dominique's genius was to disrupt the status quo while living within it. And there is revolution in that and deserves our tenderness, especially those who have no other choice but to live outside that particular framework. I think that's what she loved, for, lived for all her days, the inevitability of the artist having to make art and the, in, and, and the inevi, excuse me, and the inevitability of your difference and knowing no other way. Just like Anne-Marie, just like Dominique in her own individual way, which is to say queer thinking. You know the rest. The Dumanils, despite Protestant Schlumberger pairs protests on religious grounds and probably class grounds, the Protestant Huguenots prided themselves in their educated status and considered the Catholics bullies. You know the rest. Dominique converts to Catholicism in 1931 and remains one for the rest of her life. Claude dies in 1936, and Jean joins the family business and goes on to co-manage the, fam the family, the company his father's, excuse me, and Jean joins the family business and goes on to co-manage the company his father-in-law founded with great success. Then there's the war. In 1938, Jean joins Dominique's sister Sylvie's husband in Bucharest, where they were overseeing Schlumberger's operations in Romanian oil fields. And at night, John, dressed as a workman, or maybe as Dominique the mechanic, pours sand and oil into the casings in the locomotives serving the German war effort. John is almost caught and traveling through Iraq and India. He makes his way west, east to Houston, the site of the Schlumberger's American operations. Dominique, traveling with her sister Sylvie, and her by then three children, <clears throat> finally gets the necessary papers to join John in Houston. But because John is also running the family's oil fuel services in Venezuela, 
he can't do all his work from Houston. So he and Dominique leave their children for two and a half years to deal with business down there. In those days, husbands came first, and Latin America, as that part of the world was known, was of great importance, especially during the war. Imagine the rupture. Imagine what those children felt. Imagine what must be hidden to live and transgress in a world of appearances. And yet there was a strong belief in grace, in the transfiguring power of love and beauty. And like all good immigrants, <clears throat> the Duminils change, adapt, change, and try to adapt again to become the best version of their adopted land, America. But, but you know that, and you know the rest. In 1936, Dominique meets Father Marie Alain Cotier, a Dominican priest, and it's he who encourages the Manils to collect, saying it is a moral duty to give back, especially as their fortune increases. And as their attention turns more and more to contemporary American art, Dominique develops too as she pushes against her careful, fiscally, care, fiscally careful Protestant background. And with the help of Jean and her faith, and it's both Jean and her deep converse, conversations with Couturier that helps the girl who was, for all intents and purposes, born in the 19th century, enter the 20th century. Oops. I don't remember just how much or how little I knew about Dominique before I came to the Manila for the first time in 2016, but it didn't take me long to fall in love with her. I have always been drawn to people, and women in particular, who struggle to cast off who they were supposed to be in favor of who they mean to be, and I think Dominique's personal narrative of transformation, of, as her father said, always becoming, runs parallel to the new art she championed and that I first saw when I was a student so long ago. As an undergraduate at Columbia University in the 1980s, I had fallen in love with art history and stayed in love with it, inspired in part by the oratory skills and mind of a great art historian named Kenneth Silver. When I met him, he was teaching a course called Art of the 60s, and it included the work, work the Manils collected, Warhol, Nolan, Rauschenberg, and the like. Ken was electric with ideas. He wore a leather jacket that squeaked when he walked in front of the blackboard. For his class, I wrote my final essay about Warhol's portraits of Ethel Skull and Holly Solomon. In that essay, I talked about some of the images from de Kooning's women series and how de Kooning, even his collage like rippings and violent juxtapositions, still equated good white teeth with the American way of health. Warhol had stained Holly's teeth. <clears throat> Warhol had stained Holly's teeth to let us know she was a bad girl. Who was she kissing? Who was she sucking off? Did she smoke cigarettes? Was she a potty mouth? Was she a re repository for all that was foul or beautiful in the American art world? And sometimes it takes a queen not to be afraid of a bad girl. Also, that Ethel skull. What did it mean for women to admit to wanting to be seen? And were we seeing Warhol's faggotry through their badness? When Ken handed me back my paper, it was littered with enthusiasm. Yes, exclamation point, next to one sentence. Of course, I never thought about it that way, to, next to another line. I was chuffed, of course, and especially after Professor Silver, he was not Ken for years, called me in his office and said, his leather jacket squeaking. Mr. Owls, we all use surnames then, I could be fired for this, but are you a homosexual? And when I answered in the affirmative, he said, oh, thank God, and semi-collapsed across his desk. During this time, connoisseurship was part of the curriculum at Columbia, a requirement, and while everything at the university was unfamiliar to me, it was, it was an all-boys school then, and a lot of the kids took vacations to look at art, and their parents collected things while their boys played sports. Connoisseurship was the most unfamiliar to me. As I understood it, connoisseurship trained one to become a person who is, quote, especially competent to pass critical judgments in an art, particularly one of the fine arts or matters of taste. <clears throat> the fact, unquote, the fact that I instinctively equated taste with money was instinctual, and then the questions would not stop, stop coming. 
What constituted a judgment when it came to art? Who established this taste? Well, there were artists and there was their audience, the people who could afford to support them. And beyond that, I was unaware of the apparatus of dealers and managers and bean counters and image makers. What interested me were those queer curators, such as the late former Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, Henry Geltzahler, and the ever-present Diego Cortez, who in the mid-19, who in the, in the early 1980s made two, two extraordinary shows, the New York School at the Met and Diego's New York New Wave at PS1. I'm old enough to have been at the opening of Diego's show, and I went with a friend who was involved with Basquiat, and New York New Wave was a swirl of the high and low and people I knew and didn't know. We were all just out of our teens. What I lived, loved reading about Getzal's show and seeing Cortez's show was how each was related to the dismantling not only of the hierarchy of museum culture, these were exact, aggressively de democratic shows, but the whole notion of connoisseurship. In each, the people who came to see the shows made the shows. The curator was the presiding audio, audio, artist, but not the dominant one. Neither was language, but what dominated the thinking then was how image inspired language, and then took it back, took those words and made something else as I kept looking and looking. <clears throat> I had grown up in a family of women and was instinctually frightened of or distrustful of the idea of authority. I had been raised on welfare. Was this connoisseurship of other people's bodies? Yes, as we will see as we go along this evening, some people think of connoisseurship as a way of controlling other people's bodies. Ken taught me otherwise. He taught me that art, society, politics, and radicalism are breaking away from the known as a way of crashing through to the unknown and then reporting back on it through art, through language, through curating. Through one of Ken's lectures, I listened to Wrapped so long ago. Yes, this was possible through art history. That art not only mirrored the world, but the world that sprung up like flowers and dreams and sometimes poison around it. Dominique was one of the builders of those that world. In class, Ken described the Manil's excellent collection of modern art and the beautiful design of the building, a jewel floating in subtropical air. And he showed us Warhol's portrait of Dominique. It was gentler than his pictures of Holly and Ethel, but in this work he made Dominique colored too, just like my mother. It takes a minute to get used to the Manil especially if art history has tried to mess with your head with connoisseurship. What astonishes is the building's warmth and accessibility. I wasn't surprised to learn from Geraldine Aramanda, the wonderful former archivist, call me Jerry, everyone else does, that Dominique took tickets herself in the lobby after she'd welcomed folks into her home. After I'd settled, <clears throat> after I'd settled into the archives to look at things, Jerry gave me a little bracelet. It read WWDD. Jerry translated, what would Dominique do? I don't think I've ever been to a museum like this before. And I laughed. And then Jerry started telling me wonderful stories about my crush. One story she told me involved a, a man who painted the gallery walls at Rice for Dominique. She liked this one guy in particular. But one day when she arrived at the gallery space, the man was crying. Dominique asked him what was wrong, and he said that his wife had left him for a younger man. And without missing a beat, Dominique replied, but this is divine, no? It's very rare for an older woman to find a younger man. <laughs> no matter how Catholic she became, Dominique's Protestant pragmatism was never far behind. <clears throat> On those first days at the Manil, I was allowed to visit what Dominique called her treasure rooms or storage spaces near the ceiling of the museum proper. It was like falling backwards into a dream. Byzantine crosses and warhols and poons and dines and any number of masters jumped out at me. It was like entering the mind's laboratory, Dominique's mind. But in the midst of this rich display, there were several objects in one of the treasure rooms that stood out and that felt disjunctive. I knew right away that the work was 
by Larry Rivers. You cannot make, mistake his graphic power and love of borders and drawing skill for anyone else's. But the pieces I saw were about racial caricatures, and I could not tell at first what the purpose of it all was. Back in the archives, Jerry was most helpful. She explained that while a lot of researchers showed up for the deluxe show, some American history, which had preceded it, had not gotten a great deal of attention because of its incendiary nature. I gathered that it had been an experiment that failed, one that the success of the deluxe show eclipsed. Failure is elixir to my imagination. It raises more questions than success. What were all those outsized Rivers pieces doing in Dominique's treasure room? And why were they mostly of black figures? After the Dimonils opened the Rothko Chapel in 1971, a space Dominique described as a place for transformation, the Dimonils wanted to create a show that talked about and described the black American experience. This was not an unusual move on their part. Since 1960, Dominique had carried around the idea of making a series of books called The Image of the Black in Western Art that would be just that. In 1970, she was still looking for the right editor for the series, while John, always committed to civil rights, had provided moral, moral and financial support to young Houstonians like the late Mickey Leland, a powerful anti-poverty activist and a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. The Demonils, to the Demonils, activism was real. They knew change was real, and they wanted to show that they wanted a show that would talk about the reality of black American lives. There had been on the page marvels such as Sonia Sanchez and June Jordan and Paul Marshall and James Baldwin, but museum culture had yet to catch up with the radicalism of these voices. Oops. Do I start it or do you start it? Okay. Just that. Ah, thank you, thanks, sir. Coming home from school, and this is it. Guess how young I must have been. And my mother asked me, and my teacher was called a white. And I said she was a little bit called, a little bit white. Because she was about your color. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I was right. That's part of the dilemma of being an American Negro. That one is a little bit colored and a little bit white. And not only in terms, in physical terms, but in the head and in the heart. And there are days, this is one of them, when you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. How precisely are you going to reconcile yourself to your situation here and how you are going to communicate to the vast, heedless, unthinking, cruel, white majority that you are here. And to be here means that you can't be anywhere else. I'm terrified at the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. These people have deluded themselves for so long that they really don't think I'm human. I at least it's on their conduct, not on what they say. And this means that they have become in themselves moral monsters. Well, Jim, I can That's see. a terrible indictment. Yes. I, I mean every word I say. Well. The art world at that time was as segregated as the rest of the country. It knew who it was vis-a-vis -vis Johns and Rauschenberg and Warhol, but not who it was vis-a-vis -vis Cheryl Sutton, Alma Thomas, or even Peter Bradley, the black abstract expressionist who organized the deluxe show. <clears throat> Put on at the old deluxe theater in Houston's Fifth Ward, a primarily black neighborhood. Bradley had been approached by de Menil to make an exhibition that would act as a corrective to the show Bradley himself had been a part of, Some American History, curated by Larry Rivers, who is the de facto villain, or shall I say clumsy monster, of our story. More about Rivers later, 
and more about Dominique too. But for now, a little bit about the artist and curator Peter Bradley, who acts as a kind of bridge between a mistake the Dimonils made and their desire to make it right. Born in 1940 in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, Bradley is, at 81, an abstract expressionist whose grand paintings reflect not only his inner temperature, the permutations of his mind and forward thinking, but his treatment of light as a kind of solid and brushwork that is the expression of liquid thought in action. In addition to being an artist, Bradley worked from 1968 to 1975 as the associate director of the Pearls Gallery, which had been co-founded by the brothers Klaus and Richard Pearls, German refugees whose parents had a great interest in art. After Richard moved to Los Angeles in 1939, Klaus, Klaus carried on working in the art world with his wife, Polly eventually, his wife Polly, eventually their gallery went on to make a name for itself as purveyors of African art, French modernism, and with Americans such as Alexander Calder. I mentioned Bradley's work with Klaus because it's highly un unlikely that an American gallerist, um, that an American gallerist would have made a black man a director of a gallery, and equally, equally unlikely that he would have supported his vision, that which gave equal weight to Africa and Europe, the ephemeral and the historical. The art world was a very small place then, and it's not out of the question to think that the Dumanils, who always kept an apartment in New York, associated with the Pearls, and by extension Bradley, especially after Rivers introduced them. In all likelihood, Bradley, given his relationship to artists the Dumanils collected, and his friendship with Rivers was one of the few blacks trading in a capitalist world. A capitalist world the Dumanils brilliantly and valiantly and sometimes awkwardly tried to infuse with meaning. This from a, night, from a 2017 interview with Bradley. The artist says he might have met the Dumanils through Mark Rothko, in fact. He says, well, I used to spend a lot of time with Mark Rothko. He used to come to Pearls and spend at least two or three hours there every week. That's how I got to know him. He'd come visit me on Thursdays. He smoked so many cigarettes, his whole chest was covered in ashes. And the Pearls gave me a lot of flack for spending so much time talking to, quote, this idiot, as Dolly called him. They hated him because he would come over all the time and not buy anything. I think that Rothko turned the Dimnils on to me. I'm not quite certain. I still don't know how it ever happened, but I know it was John de Manil who came to Pearls and asked me if I would put a show together for him. And I told him, why me? And he said, well, I think you're the best person to do this that we know of. And I said, well, why don't you take a look at some other black people because I'm really busy, I'm really busy. <laughs> but later, John de Manil called me on the telephone and begged me to take the job. <clears throat> Larry had that show, Some American History, with the Dumanils in Houston before me. He showed a bunch of images from the 1920s of black folks being lynched down in Houston. I never understood why he did that. That show was a huge disaster, and that's when the Dumanils decided to contact, you, con contact me to curate a show for them. I looked for anyone who was painting and making good, hard abstraction. Oops. Um, when I say the word hard, I mean artists who were making abstract art and who had suffered to make it, living in poverty and so forth, black and white artists alike. Rivers' Some American History was not only an aesthetic failure, it had failed morally. In an extraordinary letter from 1970 to John and Dominique, Rivers comments basically on the aesthetic inferiority of the black artists he was including, while talking about how much he's done to understand them, including going up to Harlem, delving into the stacks at the Schomburg, um, talking to black girls, and so on. Indeed, he took it upon himself to install certain works, like Peter Bradley's Marcus Garvey, presumably to make it better or more in his image. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I, that's my fault. That's the uh, deluxe show. Um, presumably to make it better or more in his image. <clears throat> Oops, no nudes yet. Um, um, the picture 
you see of this of various Houstonians coming together black and white is because of the work that Peter and Dominique and John put into the show. And now I want to show a clip of Bradley commenting on River's show in 1970. In addition, we have Bradley's Bradley to, um, thank you note to the Dumanils. Taken together, these artifacts belong to what I call the black acting school. In that school, you do not betray how you feel. You do not say what you think for fear of being margin further marginalized in a world that can barely contain you in the first place. You do not lose your cool over the obnoxious ministrations of curators who mangle your work or express disappointment over a heroine who hired someone in good faith, but by the same token didn't know enough people in the larger world of blackness, of course, to avoid the pitfalls of making a fashion-based mistake. <clears throat> by fashion-based, I mean Kennedy Fraser's de definition as put forth in her 1977 essay, The Fashionable Mind. She writes, many societies have been openly dominated by fashionable people, but our society is quietly permitting itself to be dominated and transformed by fashionable minds. The, the word fashion with fashionable isn't heard much anymore, but fashion is everywhere around us just the same. It's everywhere pol pol political strategies are planned, movies made, books published, exhibits mounted, critical columns turned out, dances danced, editorial policies formulated. Wherever people think, speak, or create are shared forms of self-expression. Fashion usually is neither named nor noted, but is simply the lens through which our society perceives itself and the mold to which it increasingly shapes itself. So when you look at this clip of Peter Bradley at the opening of Some American History, keep that frame in mind. And I, I'm supposed to tell them because it jumps around. Oh, there you are, hey. It sort of jumps, right? Yeah. Tell me what having a piece, having work in the show means, what, you know, what the show generally means to you. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique show, certainly. And, uh, well, I, I don't think it has anything to do with what the show means to me at all. You know, it, it only means exposure to me, black, white, green, or gray. You know, I couldn't care less. And, you know, being as I am a visual artist, I'm trying to expose myself in order to, to be able to do more art one way or another. Like Mr. Williams said at the end, that uh, he felt that it was important for us to do another step with this exhibition. And this which is just possible like, to, to make another your step. Your feeling is that it would just be another situation right. in which you can do something. Right, and I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm pleased to be in the show with someone as great as Larry. You know, this, super artist, you know, and I knew that at his age, he wished that he had someone to give him a break that he gave us. So, it's all I Fraser goes on, this hidden, powerful, mental sort of fashion is thus worth taking stock of. In spite of its great parade of intellect, its support in influential places, and its mellifluous accompaniment of self-promoting public relations, the new variety of fashion pretty much shares the creed and the imitations of the frivolous, pirouetting, old variety of fashion. The shared creed is materialistic and holds that appearances are of greater importance than substance. Among the shared limitations are fickleness, a preoccupation preoccupation with decrying the will of the majority in order to manipulate it or pander to it, and a concern with the accumulation or protection of power and profit. Although all fashion looks mobile and rebellious at times, its roots are surprisingly constant. To think or act for reasons of fashion in any given field is to support that field's established centers of power. Was it another fashionable move, or was it an act of faith and politics for John de Manil to approach Peter Bradley to make a corrective to, the, to some American history. Our black artists and curators and thinkers here to make a corrective of the pitfalls of liberalism. Not that museum culture hadn't made some effort in that direction, which is to say, to display Americans' integrationist impulse vis-a-vis -vis culture, but the attempts have been failures. There was the 1969 Metropolitan Museum 
show, Harlem on My Mind, curated by Alain Schoener, a show that neglected to include work that might tell us a thing about Harlem and her history, and its being a gathering place at one time or another for immigrant Jews, Italians, Blacks, and Hispanics. There was that, and also Schoener's failure to heed the advice of community leaders whose, whose consultation he initially sought for the show. There was, too, the Whitney Museum of American Arts, Contemporary Black Art in America, curated by Richard Dowdy. This show, too, was the subject of nasty controversy, given Dowdy's fraught relationship to the artist, which included Barbara Chase Rebeau, Joe Overstreet, and William T. Williams, the last two artists being part of some American history as well. Looking back now at Bradley's fresh, fresh vision, the ever-elusive, inclusive American vision, you can see how much he was up against and how much he wanted to achieve looking at the work in um, the deluxe show, which included, this which included a beautiful Olitsky that makes an atmosphere happen with Gilliam and Carol and, Carol and Al Leving each working for and with and then against one another to create an atmosphere filled with tension, the tension inherent in thinking. I don't go to museums or galleries for the wholeness of life, but it's broken parts. And how do we put the broken parts together to make a whole? I love looking at the photographs which include the kids coming to the show because they are responding not to what they are being told, but what is being expressed. Another ethos we can borrow during these justice before art-driven times, or no art without justice times. Bradley was an integrationist by deed and action, and he knew that to strip a show of sentimentality and create a world of sharp edges was, in the end, the visual equivalent of Joseph Papp's colorblind casting, and ideologically is of a piece with how I feel as a citizen of the world. He who was perfectly, he, who was perfectly expressed by the actor Morgan Freeman, who once said on a television interview, I don't have to play black, I am black. But how did some American history happen and why was Rivers the curator? <clears throat> In the 1970 letter I referred to earlier, the peevish Rivers blames it all on John de Manil, saying that John didn't trust black artists to make a show of their own work and that they needed Rivers' imprimatur to legitimize the pro project. Elsewhere, Rivers says that he's the man for the job because he was a Jew and understood the black condition. He also says that it was John, John's idea for Rivers to curate the show because he couldn't find anyone else. Originally, the Dumanils commissioned Rivers to do a show at Rice University that would include his view of black American history. I'm sure that their choice of this particular artist had not only to do with his hard sell, where they're being outside Jewishness and blackness and not assuming they knew much about either, but there was feeling there and a need to support witness. As a matter of fact, um, to read the cor cor correspondence about the building of some American history is to watch John and Dominique enter our fairy tale with the eyes of innocence half closed from a June 1969 letter from John to, to, to Rivers. Dear Larry, we have had several conversations about the history of Afro-Americans, and it was great that you should be enthusiastic as we are for this project. We think that you should work in close liaison with Ronald Hobbs, who knows in his blood what it means to be black. How frustrating, yet how promising. You want to associate a black artist to your work, and we understand that you have Daniel Johnson in mind. The history of African Americans will be part of a Larry Rivers exhibition to be held at the Institute for the Arts, Rice University next spring. Thus, we should have your work not later than early February 1970. Yours, John. But our Dominique wasn't so convinced. In a letter dated December 19th, 1969, she writes to Frank Lloyd Wright, a gallerist at the Marlboro Gallery where Rivers showed, Dear Frank, it occurs to me that we never send you a sent you a copy of the letter we sent to Larry Rivers on June 19th, commissioning him to do history of the Afro-Americans. Please excuse this oversight. Larry invited us to his studio about six weeks ago. We liked what we saw and the concept of it, but there wasn't much of it, and we were a little bit worried. Recently having dinner with Larry, I told him of my worries. He told me in his usual convincing way that now he knows what he wants to do that he works fast when he gets underway. 
I was impressed. How could one fail not to be impressed by Larry, but not entirely convinced? Yours, Mrs. John de Manil. Faith doesn't mean you don't see people clearly, and when Rivers turned against the de Manils, as he turned against any, everyone else in the project, it was Dominique who, was, who said to one of his handlers, Larry is a greedy person, but he always was. Part two next week. <laughs> Part two on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. It's fun, it's like a TV serial. Um, <laughs> now you'll get to hear all about Larry next, next time. Um, I, think she, um, I think she saw through it very quickly. And um, you'll find out next, um, sorry, on Thursday that uh, she tried to save the situation and um, people in New York weren't having it. Um, it was excruciating for her, I think, um, to have made the mistake um, knowing it was a mistake. But making the effort, I think, was also part of what she was about. And you don't, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? I think it really woke her up, so. Anyway, she's great. Um, and I hope some very clever editor reads her letters because uh, as the kids say, she's completely transparent and um, she just, there's no small talk in the letter. She tells you um, what she feels. And I'm very glad that she had um, these deep experiences in her life that changed her life. Um, I'm, I can take questions. So I've got a to, mic here if you just raise your hand. Oh, there you go. Um, ah. Thank you so much. What a fantastic talk. Thank you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the experience going through the archive and the kind of intimacy of getting um, uh, close to a subject sure. that you will never actually know and maybe falling in love with them again. Yes. Um, do, do you guys know there's the, there's the only one um, person that I know that has this particular kind of affect that Dominique has. It's a, a woman named Victoria Miro. She's a dealer in London. And um, I was just besotted. And her, her gallery director said, you've bewitched her. Um, and it was because what you feel with Victoria is what you feel with Dominique is that they're so open to the possibility of collaboration and that they there are not a lot of people who do that, especially people of means. There's a lot of fear. And it, it, it's very hard to keep, shifting, oops, to keep shifting what you're supposed to do with what you want to do. Um, she could have just been a very nice wife, right? Uh, and made a nice home for him. And, all of that stuff, but I think that when you have a grand project like this, it's very attractive to read about because it's not always going to be a, a, a win situation. You know, there are going to be lots of mistakes and one never feels that she's failing morally. That's the most important thing when you read the letters, is that she made, she made some pretty, sometimes awkward decisions or not great decisions, but you don't get the sense it's because she's a bad person. And so when you're in the archives with her, you're privy to her intimacy. I mean, she's just, you know, as it goes on, and I wish I had the time to quote all the letters, but she keeps warning John not to give him all the money. Just, she's like, just pay him quarterly. And John keeps giving him the money and getting disappointed. And so, um, she's not only dreaming, but she's a practical dreamer. And she knows that um, certain people are not gonna change. There are all sorts of documents where she tries to um, 
intercede for the artists, he was taking their money too. So that he would say, oh, send it to me. So that's how many Peter's fee. <laughs> and Peter would never get paid. Um, so after a while, I just think that when you're in those archives with her, she's really expressing her true self. And um, we forget the art of letter writing was so valuable, right, to history and getting a sense of who a person was. And I really like the fact that she's not pretending anything. Even when it's her own mistake, she'll be the first to admit it. I think that's a, it's more than I can say about myself. You know. <laughs> I always want to get out of it, right? <laughs> who doesn't? Alive, that is, but anyway. <clears throat> yes, hello. Hi, um, thank you so much for this talk. It was really enlightening. Um, especially learning more about Dominique de Manil's early life, and yes. I really appreciated your queer reading of Dominique, potentially. Yes. And I was wondering how you might reconcile that with um, what I can... I feel a little guilty asking this question, actually. Um, but Why? <laughs> that she didn't really collect female artists. Well, and how? see, this is so, I mean, <laughs> it's great because, um, God, you know, really, this should be three days, actually. <laughs> um, and I said that to Michelle. I said, you know, this is very unfortunate that I only have two days. But um, I really wish, it's a, it's a huge blind spot. And it's um, not unusual at the same time. And that's the sad thing, right? We've known many women who don't, I don't identify with other women or, or support um, in that way. And I think that there's, uh, it was a really very interesting piece in The New Yorker about her at the end of her life. And she became much more open to her children. Her children noticed it. And, and I think that it's just, we all, grow at our own pace. I think that if she had had another 10 years, there'd be a permanent Judy Chicago in the you know, <laughs> hall. It's sort of, I just think that it was that class and that particular upbringing and that father, you know, um, it was about his approval. And you couldn't imagine anyone butcher than Anne Marie, come on. <laughs> like, let's go back, hold on. <laughs> hold on, let's just take a look. Other way, it's not going the other way. There it is. I mean, that's Carson, come on. That, I mean. Okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? I, appre I appreciate <laughs> your answer. But I think that, I think that it's, I think that it's, um, I think, I think it takes a long time to be a true feminist. It takes a long time. Um, because when I, I often used to teach at women's colleges, and the first day I would say, you know, please enjoy each other because you're in the majority and this is the last time it's gonna happen. And you have great strength in that. And I don't think she had that. I think that once she and Anne-Marie split, you know, the friendship split and Anne-Marie was on the road and so on. I don't think that she had consoling women friends. Maybe her sisters, I'm not really sure. Um, I just don't think it's what they did. Sorry, that just reminds me obviously of Jermaine McKeggy, who was- Say, I can't hear you. Oh, that reminds me of Dominique's great friend, Jermaine McKeggy, yes. who she was very close with and who she had Warhol paint Jermaine's yes. um, I mean, it's there, right? It's, yeah. so, it's super complicated, but I think, I think that the, the um, it wasn't the first thing that she would think of, I don't think. And I think that similarly, I mean, I could only take the, originally these talks were going to be, I was gonna talk about Raid the Icebox as well and how she was, when you go to the treasure room, I, I just thought I was like sort of in gay heaven. There was this room and there was just gay art. And um, 
I think it was, that was as close as she could get to it for herself at that time. I'm thinking that if she had another 10 years, the evolution would have been, keep going. I don't think she ever stopped. I think that also, to be fair, that she was, um, it was just that era when you did what, you went with your husband. It's pretty isolating, I, I would imagine. But thank you. Thank you. I wish I could do three days. I swear that was going to be the last one. I was going to be all about that. But there's just no time. But maybe I'll do it. Come back. Maybe I'll come back. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and one more? For one question? more question. Right. More? No? I mean, everybody wants to have their Pinot Grigio <laughs> now and a little supper. So thank you. I hope you come back on Thursday. Thank you. <laughs>